I think in short, the answer to should you buy one of these mini lathes, the answer is yes. But also, probably not, at least if you can avoid it. Now I'm sure that answer makes a lot of sense, but let's take a bit of time to go through that answer, and I promise it will make sense. Now despite their size, which really isn't saying much, there is something about these lathes that draws you to them. Probably the prospect of being able to own your own lathe for a little over 600 bucks, which is really a fraction of what you'd pay for even a big sized normal lathe. But with that comes limitations. Limitations that tend to give these machines a bad reputation. And having used this machine for well over 4 years, as long as you work within its limits, you'll be able to make some really good parts with it. However, it's still important to know exactly what you're getting into when you're considering one of these machines. And with all that said, this machine has been so useful to me. It's gotten me through 4 years of university, and it was so useful to have it on hand. So let's take a quick look at the machine, and see some of the pros and the cons. So for those of you who are new to my channel, this is my Sieg C3. It's a 7x14 mini lathe. Sieg is the company that makes this one, but there are other 7x14 lathes on the market, and they are sold under different names, and from what I can tell, they are all pretty similar. And the 7x14 refers to the size of the lathe. So this machine could theoretically hold a 7 inch diameter piece of plate. Anything larger and you'd hit the bed. The lathe can also hold a piece that is about 14 inches long between centres, but once you fit a chuck and a live centre, it's closer to about 11 inches. Now I don't know about you, but 7x14 isn't exactly a huge amount of space, especially for a lathe. And in the event you ever need to machine anything bigger, generally you're going to be out of luck. It's for that reason why when you ask anyone about buying one of these lathes, you'll always have someone say, just buy the biggest lathe that you can fit into your space, and if possible, buy used, rather than getting one of these lathes. And generally, I do somewhat agree with that sentiment, maybe less so on buying the used, depending on the condition, but I do think you should try and avoid buying these lathes if you can. I'd say 9 times out of 10, you're going to benefit from having a much larger and heavier lathe especially if you're planning on machining a lot of steel, because it takes a good amount of force to shear that metal, and the lathe is expected to resist any of that bending and deflection. And the fact that these lathes are so light is going to cause us a lot of issues. I think this one here weighs in at a little over 40 kilos, and of course 40 kilos isn't exactly light, but realistically we would want it to be at least 4 or 5 times heavier than this. Of course if you're machining aluminium or plastic, you're going to be fine, but machining steel can be a little bit difficult. It's not as bad as everyone makes it out to be, but with a properly tuned lathe, you can definitely do some good machining with steel, as long as your parts aren't too big. Trying to machine anything big, and you're going to have to get a much bigger lathe. Even if it does physically fit in this lathe, it's not going to work. I recently tried to turn a big piece of steel, and even though it physically did fit in the chuck, it just didn't seem to work. There's not enough rigidity in order to machine it. With that said though, I do think there is an argument for having a much smaller and lighter machine, and that it's very easy to move and set up. I have helped move two lathes before, with one requiring a forklift and the other one requiring an engine hoist in order to move it with the big lathe being somewhere in the neighbourhood of 6 to 700 kilos. Now depending on the location of your workshop, or how serious of a hobby it is, you might not be able to or might not want to rent an engine hoist just in order to move a lathe. That would not have been possible at my old workshop for instance, and as a result, this lathe was effectively my only choice. This lathe therefore was just convenient. It was able to be delivered by mail, and once I received it, I simply popped it into the wheelbarrow in order to move the crate, and once I got the lathe out of the crate, I could easily move it around by myself. And for a lot of people, that is definitely something that you do want to consider, because moving around a several hundred kilo piece of machinery can be very difficult. Just make sure that once you get it out of the box, you should bolt it down to a very heavy workbench, or at least a piece of very thick plate. It makes a huge difference when machining, plus it's also very safe. The last thing that you want is a lathe that can very easily move around as you're machining, which is incredibly dangerous. So pretty much in summary, all of this was to say, it really depends on what you're looking to do. If this is purely a hobby, maybe you want to learn machines on a budget, these machines can be really good. 
However, having any lathe is going to be better than having no lathe, as the saying goes, and if this is your only option, you should be able to make really good parts with it, and you should be able to make it work. Now the quality of these machines has always been a bit of a mixed bag, and from my experience, they aren't super well built. But when it comes to the parts that really matter, they do a really good job. So in terms of the overall fit and finish from the factory, they didn't do a good job here. The tail stock wasn't aligned, the gibs weren't properly adjusted, and the paint was flaking off before it even got out of the box. Not very impressive, but it's nothing that can't be adjusted, and it's nothing that really impacts the overall running of the machine. The bits however that do matter, such as the spindle, the bores for the headstock bearings, and the ways and the lead screws, are all very precisely machined, and they do a really good job there. And in fact, it's actually quite impressive. According to the indicator here, the spindle is concentric to the bore within 0.01mm, which I think is really good for a $600 lathe. I've seen a lot worse on much more expensive lathes. On a similar note, once you take the twist out of the bed, I've been able to get parts that are 20cm long with less than 0.01mm of taper in it, which is really impressive. It does take a fair amount of adjustment, but these machines can produce some very accurate parts, preferably on the smaller end. For example, these are some of the tools that I've made for the milling machine, and the tolerance on the shank is 20mm plus 0mm and minus 10 microns, which is a pretty tight tolerance. And it's not too difficult to hit that tolerance on this machine. And for larger pieces, hitting tight tolerances can be done, but it's just a little bit more difficult, considering that you do have to run steady rests, just to make everything a little bit more rigid. The only real gripe I've had with this machine is the electric box. About a year in, the control box for the DC motor blew, and the price for a replacement was somewhere north of two to 300 bucks. Apparently the boards can get very hot under use, and they don't get adequate cooling in the current box. If I'd known about that at the time, I would have added a small PC fan, just to keep it cool. Not very impressive, but nothing that can't be fixed. In any event, it ended up being a lot cheaper and quicker to simply replace the motor. The stock one anyway was quite underpowered, at only 350 watts. Although most of them seem to come nowadays with 5 or 600 watt motors, which seems to be enough, especially for a mini lathe. And speaking of which, it is a little bit optimistic to expect that these machines are going to work perfectly out of the box. Like I mentioned before, the gibs and the carriage retaining plates are going to need adjusting in order to get everything tight and rigid. But adjustments aren't quite everything. There's definitely quite a few upgrades that you should be able to do to your lathe that will make your lathe run a lot better. Obviously my lathe has been heavily modified, and whilst it can do some very impressive cuts, you only have to do a few of them in order to really improve your lathe. Now one upgrade that really gets overlooked is adding a metal spacer to the spindle assembly. The spacer helps add preload to the spindle bearings, and from the factory, for whatever reason, it's made out of plastic. To replace it, simply make a new one from steel, and what it will do is it will help reduce chatter, and it makes a huge improvement. It also makes a huge difference if you replace the headstock bearings with tapered roller bearings, which should only cost about $30 or $40 for a pair. The stock bearings are just your regular deep groove ball bearings, and they really aren't suited to this type of work, and they do cause chatter, and they do wear out quite quickly. Now it definitely helps if you have a press in order to press out the spindle bearings, but I did it with a mallet, and it seemed to work just fine. Of course though, I have gone a lot further than doing these two upgrades, and many of the upgrades have paid off, and many are definitely worthwhile checking out, but as you do more and more upgrades, the improvement that you get is going to be less and less. But at the end of the day, there's only so many things we can do to the mini lathe, and we're still going to be limited by the mini lathe frame. And as much as I'm really impressed by what it can do, I think there's so much more you can do by just getting a much bigger lathe. However, it was a good amount of fun to improve it. Now, apart from the ones I've previously mentioned, there are two things that I'd like to mention. Firstly, the top slide is quite poorly designed. 
From the factory, the lead screw is not captive, so as you try and turn the hand wheel, the lead screw will actually pull the hand wheel and it will jam the whole assembly. So you do have to add a block to prevent this happening. I'm not sure how they overlooked this issue, but thankfully the fix is quite simple. Personally though, I think it's a lot better and easier to simply ditch the top slide in favour of a solid tool post. Simply a block of metal with holes drilled in it. Doing this will make it a lot more rigid. Obviously you won't be able to use the top slide to cut tapers, but you might be surprised just how little the compound actually gets used. Secondly, and this is one that just can't be fixed, is the bed, which is made from unhardened cast iron. As you can imagine, the bed receives quite a lot of wear because the carriage moves over it in order to move, and that's going to cause a fair amount of wear over the years. Now, if it was evenly wearing, it wouldn't be much of an issue, but the problem is most of the wear is going to be closer to the chuck end. That's where the carriage does most of the work, and that's where it spends most of its time. The carriage is almost never down at the tailstock end, and after all these years of use, I can feel that it has worn ever so slightly more down at the headstock end. The carriage gibs are tight on the bed in order to keep the carriage as rigid as possible, and as I move the carriage from one end to the other, I can feel the effort required in order to turn the hand wheel change. One end has slightly more wear than the other, and the gibs are grabbing more at the tailstock end. Now obviously this will happen to any piece of machinery, especially considering how much this one has been used over the past four and a bit years. And it's obviously not a huge amount of wear, but it's definitely noticeable. The thing is, we have to ask, what will this be like after 8, 10 or 15 years? It's only going to get worse as time goes on. And after time, it might need to be scraped or ground again in order to get everything as level as possible. Of course, I have used this lathe quite a lot. You may not use it as much as I have had to, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. Now, I only say this because most lathes that are bigger than this have hardened ways. The cast iron is heat treated in order to harden it, and that helps protect the ways from any damage, and it also helps extend the machine's working life. This might not be something too important, but it's definitely something that you should consider. Now a lot of people have differing opinions on this matter, and personally, I don't have any strong feelings one way or the other. And it probably comes down to where you live, and how good you are at inspecting machines before buying them. Plus, it also depends how well you trust the person, because when you're buying it from them, you are sort of trusting that they have taken well care of the machinery before you buy it. Now where I live, the used machine market isn't all that great, and there just aren't a whole lot of options. And the ones that do come up are usually big industrial lathes or old equipment that is not in good condition. Now from what I hear, the market for used equipment in Europe and North America is a lot better than where I live. And if that's the case, and that's where you live, the case for buying a mini lathe might be a lot less stronger than it is here in Australia. I want to end this video hopefully on a positive note, by just saying, having any lathe will be better than having no lathe at all. Yes, you will be better off getting a bigger lathe, but if this is your only option for the time being, don't be too discouraged. Back when I first got this lathe, I wasn't as fortunate as I am now to have this great workspace, and this was realistically my only choice. And despite its shortcomings, I've had a real blast with it, and I've been able to make some real great projects with this machine. And despite its size, I've only ever run out of space maybe three or four times, which I think is quite remarkable. Overall, it's been great, and it's been great to have you all along for the ride. Thanks for watching.